right, we're going to go ahead and start. Thank you guys for showing up and getting free lunch. It's awesome. Um, here's the real reason you came. This is Ryder Richards. He is an artist and based in Fort Worth right now. He's been all over the place. He has his own podcast, which you can talk to you about. He also is going to talk about how we use AI in art, and specifically in regards to the project out in the atrium, which is a re-envisioning of the Salvador Dali Alice in Wonderland that's a Andrew Plains that Dina curated just recently. So this is kind of a conversation between those two shows, and he's going to kind of get into it. So please listen to him, enjoy, and ask him questions at the end. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Yep. Thanks for showing up. Oh. With pizza in your hands. Um, so let's say to start with, hmm. So I gave a lecture maybe a month, month and a half ago that was really kind of on how some of the problems with AI and how it gets going. A lot of it had to do with like fears and concerns that people had. And so I sort of kind of got into also like just what is AI, right? Like how does it work? A lot of people that are afraid of it don't really even know what it does or how it works. I mean, it's how many times people say something about an algorithm, but they can't name a single algorithm, right? So what we do is we sort of broadcast and generalize these things out. So one of the things I'm kind of interested in is figuring out how these things work. So for instance, y'all heard of ChatGPT, I'm sure. This is a large language model, an LLM. Generative images have two different ways they really function, GAN and diffusion models. So this is a general adversarial network and diffusion models is something like machine learning. Diffusion models is more like, oh, well, it's bizarre. They, it actually takes noise and static and predicts it in reverse. So when we kind of get into how these things work, of course, almost all the images in the presentation are AI generated. Uh, you can tell the difference between them as well. Like these are definitely done through Dolly because that's the style of the image. And the longer you play in the platforms, you figure out which ones do which things better and which platforms do which ones worse. So for some of them, you want to do architectural stuff. There's going to be one who's better. You want to do something that's more bizarre and maybe uses celebrity faces or something. Dolly and Midjourney are not going to really allow that, but Stable Diffusion will allow it because you're running Stable Diffusion on your own PC. So that's the way that some of these things work is there's differences in all of them. They all have different strengths and weaknesses as well. You can see there's still pictures like this where they said something about playing pickleball and it actually put people playing basketball and dropped a pickle into it because it doesn't always understand what's going on. So this is some of the, the more fun aspects you can get into with AI. This is all from Stability Diffusion. This is how it works. You can get on their website and just read about how it functions. If you take a whole bunch of pictures of animals and you turn them all into noise, then you so this being what noise is, you can actually do it in reverse. Once you train a program how to take something into noise, it can take noise and turn it back into a thing. So this is very bizarre to think about, that that's how image generation works for a lot of these programs like Stable Diffusion, which now also does video. You can do AI generated video, give it some text, and it will produce an entire video for you. So anyway. What we start getting into at some point, though, is the politics of all of this, right? Is why some people are in one camp and other people are in another camp. Some people are like, no, let's shut this down. Other people are like, no, let's launch into the future. Let's go do something more exciting with this. And then when you get into, of course, there's usually also a couple of bigger camps of what could possibly go wrong. One of them is, of course, Skynet, Terminator, the machines are gonna take over, they're gonna kill all humans, or Matrix style, they're gonna put a, turn us into batteries. You know, There's a whole bunch of dystopian science fiction out there that has warned about making the machines smarter than us. And even going back to like the Asimov series where you know, he has rules about how to create these. We had the Turing test. Apparently now all these GPT models can pass the Turing test. And so we had limits at one point for what made a machine smart or not. And science fiction helped us with a lot of that along the way. Um, we also have this kind of science fiction, right? But this isn't science fiction, really. It's just predicting into the future what will happen. And in this movie, which is now like 20 years old, it's called Idiocracy, then the people just get dumber and dumber and dumber over time. And it's partially because they're so reliant on machines. 
so what happens to our society when we get so dumb that we can't do anything because we're reliant on machines, but then how do you fix the machines when no one's smart enough to figure out how to fix them because we've all gotten dumber and dumber over time, right? So we increasingly give our, I don't know, reliance, our uh, resilience, our ability to function in the world, our agency over to machines to help us do things. At one point we did this with writing you could actually write things down so you didn't have to remember as much. So when you start looking at like a progression, historically, we always use tools to move forward. Now, these people will tell you all the great things. The founders of all the AI platforms will tell you what's so great about AI. It's gonna be a better therapist, it's gonna be cheap, it's gonna be creative, there's gonna be new things to stare at. You know, when you're bored, guess who's gonna write the next movie for you or the next video game or help out the coding? There's always going to be an upside to new technology. And there's also, of course, downsides. One of the interesting things about these guys is, you know, they are already wealthy. They're going to be making money off this. They will make more money off of it. And while some of this stuff is free right now, it's not going to be free forever. Uh, it's already starting to get to where there's more and more fees. I mean, this stuff is already moving into all the platforms we've already seen captured. You used to be able to watch YouTube without any advertisements, right? You used to be able to do these things, but as it moves on and they figure out better and better how to commodify it to advertise to us, then it becomes slightly more annoying plus manipulative unless you pay more money, but even by paying more money, they're still capturing you in a certain sense. So this is also one of the things that we can, yeah, we can kind of get into fears, I'm gonna kind of just move through this pretty quickly because you probably already have a lot of these fears or you've seen them or heard about them. We also get into the broader ones, right? Existential crisis, who are we, what are we? Is our species going to survive? Or kind of like Elon Musk says, do we have to get to Mars in order to become a two planet species? And even then, if AI takes over and we're too reliant on it, would that kill us anyway, right? Like what happens? One of the more compelling arguments I've heard is Yuval Noah Harari, who talks about the stories that AI tells, the entire reason that nations work, that communities work, that anything works is because we tell stories. And the better our stories are, the more people we can draw to us. It's also, of course, how cults are formed, right? So you have to be real careful with stories. But I think that one of the fascinating parts about storytelling with AI is if it can figure out how to tell a story better than us, that might actually be where we get sunk because we get emotionally caught up in stories and we believe them and we want to believe them. So it sort of provides us with hope. It can be very manipulative. It's also one of the reasons why for the artwork that I put together for the show that's out there, I involved a story in it <coughs> that was entirely written by ChatGPT. Okay, da, da, da. so when I talked about giving a talk previously, this was kind of the talk. It was all, how did we get here? Cybernetic systems, which is control and steerage and governance, really. So your thermostat is a cybernetic system. How you would auto drive a car is a cybernetic system. But also, if you were a pilot on a boat a long time ago and you're cruising through the seas and the winds are pushing against you one way and the waves are pushing the other, how do you keep the boat on course? That's just cybernetics. That's like you have a goal at the end, it's a target, and things are gonna push you, and you just stay on task. And you're always having to counter other things. So at the end of the day, though, they can start turning it into better and better control systems. So when anyone says cybernetics, it's really not so much about cybernetic implants, sort of like in the, the anime series on Netflix or whatever it is, then it's really more about the ability to control something. So what we talk about now is cybernetic implants. So people will have a fake arm and they call that cybernetics. But all this is sort of based around uh, issues of control, governance. When I say governance, there was a, <laughs> a way of governing a city set up in Chile and it was all based around decentralized networks, letting computers share information. And they actually saw a tremendous increase in economic output. And the idea was to give the power back to the people and get rid of all the managerial bloat in between. You don't need people running people, running people, running people down the chain. 
you just cut all that out and you just have a computer that says when things are necessary or due or when there's a shortage here and then people will show up and deliver it and they'll get paid for it and so you cut out a whole bunch of people by using computer technology of course the american government got involved very quickly because it sounded too much like communism and shut it down so that was also done by a guy named stafford beers back in the day he was an early cyberneticist um movement of futurism this is an art movement is also quite violent. It had this idea that you were gonna tear down the cities because they were gonna to be too old. And so what happens is these people create manifestos. So these guys like this would drive around in their cars and then all of a sudden there's war going on in machinery and they're just really impressed by things like rockets and tanks and cars and all this cybernetic control and where industrialization is going. And they're sort of so wooed by it that they write these manifestos and the manifestos have a disposition to them that is all based around dying quicker, sort of loving the machine. So flesh is too slow. We need to move into metal bodies. We need to become more virulent. It's the only way to survive. So as this kind of starts coming out, we run into this entire movement, the accelerationist movement. We get into ideas of like how tech needs humans to keep moving forward, right? Like a camera, when you look at the evolution of a camera, how fast it evolves versus how fast we evolve, like it's crazy. So what is happening is we're speeding up the evolution of technology while humans don't evolve very fast at all. So the idea is that we need to actually become more machinic, more machines. Machines are winning. We're simply helping them reproduce over time. And this gets into the dark enlightenment, which is a group of philosophical thinkers who really just yeah, they, they're all for it. They say machines, capitalism, everything, just push it as far as it will go. We can't find a way out of capitalism right now, so we need to lean into it so heavily that everything will break. The only way to get back to a new future is to break everything now, and the only way to do that is to shed what it means to be human. So remove everything that's human about you, embrace the machine fully, and that has become this kind of thing that has run through sci-fi and even art for a long time. It's this idea of the fixation of the machine, getting automated with it. In this book, a guy puts himself into a rocket to be launched as a sacrifice, right? It's this kind of idea of sacrificing the human for the machine. The artwork's on the far side there. That's Luis Jimenez, one of my favorite artists, right? But this kind of merging of the machine and the man. This book came out a while back, and this guy's basically arguing against all of this. He's like, whoa, 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 let's pull the brake here. We don't need to get into this desperate and suicidal auto-amputation, right? Like humans chasing this, why would we be chasing all this cybernetic stuff? Why are we chasing machines? Why are we so afraid all the time that we're going to need to somehow kill our own species? Like that's a really, important question to ask, right? Like, is it fear that is driving us into these changes? And what are we so afraid of? Like, we're afraid it's gonna take over, so the only idea left is to join with it. Like, there might be another way, but we just need to sort of put the brakes on all this kind of fear that's leading us forward. That fear is also kind of known as a death drive. When you don't know what else to do and you're so anxious, then you actually start driving forward towards death because death is the only thing that can give you rest. So that's when we start talking about suicidal autoamputation. Um, Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin, he's one of these guys that kind of brought up this idea too of when you start getting into art, you have this idea of a loss of aura. So a handcrafted object, I don't know, if I have a vase, we can all enjoy it. When I put that into a factory, it goes through a molding process and this, that, and the other, and they make thousands and thousands of them, and then you can just buy them very cheaply at any store you go to. Well, does that vase have the same resonance as the one that was made by a human? And you just go, usually we're gonna say no, that the human vase has more something going on for it. More history, texture, a better story, right? So when we start getting into, what is the difference between AI generated stuff and human generated stuff? Usually the human generated stuff is more compelling. It has a different story. There's different insights that show up in it than would be with AI. At least that's what you would hope. So the idea would be to think that AI produced materials are the equivalent of mass produced pieces. 
they're not very valuable. People aren't very into them, but maybe they do make your life easier. Maybe they do make things cheaper. So once again, this is just an example of a vase, but of course it's generated by mid-journey, right? So I just typed in, make a picture of a vase, and this is what it spits out, and it takes that long. So there's definitely a convenience aspect to this, but do you care about this? Did you care about it when you thought it was made by a human, or do you care about it if you know it's made by mid-journey? Different levels of concern show up. We're gonna kind of move through some of this a little bit quicker. I'm kind of already hit on some of these topics, but over time, what happens to the artist? What happens to the creator? And more importantly, what happens to skill or craft when a machine is replicating all those talents for us? Like, do they need to survive? Are we just gonna move into the future and flush all those old traditions down anyway? Like, what, what is all this going to entail? So those are kind of compelling questions. Also, of course, we found with AI, there's a lot of database problems. When you ask it certain things, it tags images, and so when you put in a prompt, it will spit out something that's sexually biased, racially biased. It's, it's, there's all these problems with how they're trained. So then they start trying very hard to train the data sets, and of course, Facebook recently, or no, I'm sorry, it was Google released Gemini, and it was it wouldn't show a picture of a white person on it, right? So they had gone so far one direction, they couldn't come back the other direction. So we started noticing bias in m multiple cases here where there's sort of a, a, you know, anyway, there's multiple biases showing up and what happens is that none of them are truthful and that's kind of, or none of them actually reflect reality. What they're really reflecting back is the data set they're trained on and that data set is made by humans and all these companies have value propositions that they put out that control the content that comes out of them. So nothing you're getting from them is straightforward. Everything has already been filtered through data sets and value propositions. Artists like this are doing artwork on it that is actually making real world change. They're seeing a problem, they're tracking it down, they're pointing it out, and it's actually getting uh, changes to happen. We're not gonna get too much into Noam Chomsky and Searles. What we are gonna get into though is this, right? Is like, when everything is computerized, um, can, like, what is the benefit of returning to something like Alice in Wonderland? Like, all of a sudden you're back into this realm of weirdness, it's weird storytelling, it's very surreal. There's also a story behind it where, you know, Carol wrote the story for, I guess, Alice, who was a girl that he knew in his life, I think kind of a, like a niece. And so what you end up getting into is whether or not these surreal tales from earlier still have resonance with us and why they do and what happens if we go for weirdness for weird's sake, does that work? Or does the thing still have to have some sort of, I don't know, grounding in humanity? So <laughs> I found this to just be crazy, right? That you, from Alice in Wonderland, like the newest movies are just bonkers. But prior to that, you had like very limited kind of old school drawings. So this is Lewis Carroll's original illustrations. In the middle is John Tennille, who is one of the guys that we're most familiar with. Of course, Disney did a piece of it. And then the exhibit where Salvador Dali did these works are, are pretty wild. The art pieces are just kind of crazy. They're insane, you know, I, I really like them, but they're so far out from anything that I could kind of recognize. So to Neil, once again, classic, these were wood blocks. So using classic sort of printmaking techniques and then they're tinted with color and versus Salvador Dali, right? Known for this kind of stuff. So to go back and forth between these, like one of the things I started thinking about when I was trying to make this exhibition was how do you go back and forth between those? Like how, how, do, how can these talk to each other or relate to each other? They're so utterly bizarre. Of course, this is what's, what Dolly ended up making as illustrations that are, you know, in theory, way beyond anything Tennille was doing. But also for me, who grew up on this kind of Dolly, these don't make sense either. Like these don't look to me like the dollies that I used to know. So I was like, well, this is strange. So I started using the image generation program Dolly, of course, named after Salvador Dolly, 
to make images illustrating Alice in Wonderland. So my thought was, what would AI do to pretend to be Salvador Dali doing the exact same thing that Dali did? And of course you don't get the same results. You don't even get anything close. But early on, this was the kind of results I was getting. I was like, oh my gosh, this is awful, right? Uh, there's just nothing compelling about this at all. Um, this was like the Red Queen. I was like, come on, this is like caterpillar smoking. And I don't know what that thing is with ears. Like, you know, it's just, it doesn't really know what it's doing, but it's trying really hard, right? So even if you ask it to just be Dolly, even if you spend more words and put in more prompts, you explain what Dolly is, you can tell ChatGPT to give you a prompt. Take this story, take this paragraph, take this scene, turn it into a ChatGPT prompt that will generate me the best image to illustrate this story. And it spits out some text and you say, okay, generate this story and you paste the text in and it still comes out not doing kind of what you ask it to do. It still doesn't look like a Salvador Dali. It's still like, this is definitely fantastic, but also what I found is if you put the word surreal in, it totally screws up the machine. Like it just goes off into never, never land and, and not in a good way. You know, it's, so there's key words that are actually so burdened down with baggage that the program can't operate correctly. It takes what the internet thinks that term means instead of what that term actually means to somebody like Dolly. So then I shifted over to a different program called Mid Journey to try this out and just see if it had the same problems. I like the images better. I think they're crazy. I think they're very crazy. And you can kind of, it gives you options. It gives you a grid of four at a time and you click on them and it just keeps spitting out more images and you can keep honing and refining and honing and refining. This was the caterpillar scene. This is what it gave me, right? So it gets much more weird, but also the image quality is much higher. So I found Mid Journey to be more fun to work with. Eventually I found that it gave me a whole lot more control. But even when I told it to do something like an illustrative piece, do this as a pen and ink illustration of Alice entering Wonderland. Like this is the kind of thing you would get. And so I found all this to be pretty interesting. Yeah, so these are the questions I have, right? Um, of course, is it creative? Is it meaningful? Like this becomes part of it is I'm so stuck in all the cool things this program can do that somewhere along the way in here, I lost track of what I was actually trying to do. Like I was actually trying to figure out what Dolly and Tennille, if you could blend those two images together or do something like Dolly would do in a Tennille style, what would happen? And I ended up in this kind of stuff, which is so far off the base. I mean, it looks cool. Once again, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that it's not what I wanted. I ended up at some point reacting to the machine and chasing, like chasing it rather than following out my initial goals. So what I did is decided that we needed a better story that actually fit into the Salvador Dali script because it kept trying to spit out Dali stuff in the middle of my um, Alice in Wonderland illustrations. So I had it write the entire story through Dolly's symbols with Alice's symbols. I matched them up using Notebook LM, ChatGPT, and a program called Claude by Anthropic. And between all three of those programs, and we regenerated an entire story that uses Freudian psychoanalysis and dream theory as the means to recreate Alice in Wonderland using the symbols of Salvador Dolly's artwork, but following the structure of Alice in Wonderland. So that's a lot, right? And it did it all very quickly. Da, da, da. There it is, yay. Oh, you didn't get a chance to read it. Okay, it's all printed out in the hallway and, or the atrium there. So y'all can read it when you go through there. But what's pretty compelling about all of it is you can then try to plug those prompts in and see what happens. You can even tell it to do it in pen and ink style and illustrative style, and it does it. Then you say, you know what? I'm trying to control the program too much. I'm just gonna let it do its own thing. I'm just gonna put in the prompt and see what it spits out. I've been spending days trying to control this and it's not working. Like these actually got like, I think worse at some point. I was just like, what is happening? And then they got crazy again. This is good, it's weird, it's crazy. I'm into that. And yeah, but there's also a similarity to them. 
and these are all through Dolly. I'm happy with the consistency, but it is, once again, strange. Um, but occasionally I would get things like this to pop out, right? And I'm just like, that's not really what, it's cool again, but just not really what I was asking for. This was supposed to be Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so it would kind of do these strange things, but I've even trying to tell it something like this. I said, you know, do the Red Queen in Salvador Dali style, turning her into the queen of ants with a chessboard. And it would give me something like this. So I started having trouble figuring out how I was gonna present this story, I don't know, as, as kind of a character thing, right? It's so weird. Mid Journey ended up trying to do this. It would give me something realistic. This is very strange, right? It feels like it's out of aliens in a jungle, some sort of predator thing, maybe a horror movie. And I kept letting it go. And what I would do is every time I'd use that as a source image and tell it to create the next prompt. And then I'd use this image and tell it to create this prompt. So I started cycling it, trying to get the thing to hallucinate. I thought maybe it would get crazier and crazier if I kept feeding its own answer back into itself. Um, and instead, what I found was you keep getting cool images, but they start getting closer and closer to each other. They actually start getting more similar, right? They don't get crazier, they get more normal. Like, I feel like any of these last four images, I don't, I feel like that's a, a video game screenshot that, or something I could find just about anywhere. I'm not excited by them. They're just very normal, very straightforward. They look cool once again, but I think that cool style is kind of a, what is happening is the inter, it's pulling from the internet for its answers. And the only real creativity I ever saw was directly off of the initial prompt. So the human had to put in the prompt to get the creativity. The more you feed it into itself, the less creative it got because these are all summary machines. What they do is they summarize what they gather and they flatten it out. So our real challenge here is how can we keep anything creative? And you actually have to learn to control the tool. Just like any tool, just like a hammer, a saw, a screwdriver, whatever it is, you gotta learn how to control it before you can build anything worthwhile out of it. So that's where I kind of got into this. I finally started figuring out how to feed the images in, how to get them to blend. I had to learn a whole lot about mid-journey, how to control all the parameters so that you could reference style, keep style, but still inject a level. There's actually a weirdness module in there. You have a weirdness factor from one to three you get to put in. You have a chaos factor of one to 100 you get to put in. So you can add in chaos, weirdness, character reference. So I finally, as I was getting these blended results, the blended results look much more like a blend between Dolly's illustrations and Tanil's illustrations, <coughs> but they're not like they're not similar enough that I can put both of these on a wall and pretend that these are all illustrations for the same story. They're still too weird. They're too different. I'm not getting the consistency that I needed. So I finally started figuring out how to get the consistency, how to get it to have a singular character in there. And these are pretty weird and I really enjoyed these, but I went ahead and took it like an extra step to kind of shift it a little bit more so it looked a little bit more like the illustrative style of Tennille, blended a little bit more with Dali. So these ended up becoming the final images that I used for the story. And these are all out that in the atrium printed. So if you want to read the story and check out the images, these are all out there for you. And that's it. Okay. Questions? I tried to get through that really quickly. I'm sorry if that was painful. Have any of y'all played with any of the AI tools? Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, anyone that, yes. I have a question. Sure. Is it the prompts you put in or is it the tendency of the machine to have like a 1980s like um, sci-fi style? Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna circle back around to the microphone here. <laughs> um, it, so it's a little of both. I can put in like that death drive image. I put it in to have like a, a 1980s science fiction car movie named Death Drive, you know, and I, I pushed all that. So you can push that, but a lot of these, it's spitting out. I did not offer it any style prompts on, and it was just generating what it wanted. 
it definitely thinks that certain things are cool. And I think what happens is this is like Pavlovian training. If you, and it happens in art school too, you know, if you, if you keep telling somebody this is good, this is good, this is good, they keep doing it. And so I think that the internet overall, the people using the platform give it thumbs up for certain kinds of things. So then we need to ask who's using these platforms. These are early adopter geeks, right? These are nerdy people like me who have, who like science fiction, who are in there playing around on these platforms and we're the ones giving things thumbs up. So if it's training these programs, who's it being trained by is, would be probably my answer there. But yeah, with the prompts, you have to be more and more specific over time to get what you want out of them. And I've seen prompts that are pages and pages long to get something very specific out. But a lot of people that use MidJourney just do sort of an iterative style where it shows up and then they click and then they pull out number four. And then they enlarge number four, and then they change something in number four, and it spits out four more images, and then they go four more and four more. And it really is going down the rabbit hole. Like you're just, you end up lost in this realm of trying to get these marginal gains back. But every time you do it, it takes time. So you'll spend two days trying to get one image out, and then at the end, you just realize you've thrown that time away because of the way that you have deviated. It's like a choose your own adventure where you always end up in the wrong spot. At least that's how I felt doing it. Okay, writer. Yes. Question. I think this is related to um, what Anna was saying. You mentioned how specific some of these prompts become, right, pages. When does, um, I'm trying to think how, how can I phrase this? Um, when does, how does the AI like overlap your, your specific prompt? Like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, mm. um, so you have this incredibly specific prompt, right? But then when does the AI start to kind of um, do its thing? Does, it, does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's... And is it sort of... You were, were you using four programs? or what were Yeah, but mostly, mostly it was Dolly and MidJourney, but I would use <laughs> other programs as well. But yeah, at one point I kept trying to let it be as novel as possible. I would say, how about you generate the prompt for me? And then I'd plug the prompt in and it would generate the image. And then that should, like, in theory, if I was as hands-off as possible, I would have just taken anything it offered me and say, this is pure, this is pure AI, and handed that over. But there becomes a point, right, where the better I get at it and even my word choice or even my word choice asking for the prompt means that I'm interacting. So I feel like I'm kind of complicit at all points just by even the platform I'm choosing. So I don't know when that breaks down or when they're bonded together. I know on a lot of this stuff, there's no such thing as copyright. You really can't own these images. You can own them if you do the same thing that like, um, oh, what's his, the Mona Lisa, like he put the mustache on it, right? Like you can, you can do that kind of thing where if you modify it just enough, then you can then claim ownership. But what they also are saying now is you can only claim ownership of that new layer. You can't even claim ownership of the old one. So you don't own the images you produce. I, I think there's a new one that's called like Nat, Night Cafe that gives you copyright to the images you use. But it's the only AI platform that does that. So when we start talking about ownership, agency, authenticity, how much the human is interfering with the AI versus the AI creating on its own. I think just the way the tools are structured, it just kind of crushes that conversation. Like they're just, it's very hard to parse how that would work because the way the tools are, are made, you have to put in a prompt, therefore you have to engage. So you're kind of already in it. Um, but I really don't claim ownership of these other than I, I got to a goal and an ending point and I was happy with it. Like, so yeah, but I don't, I honestly, as long as it took me to do all this, I could have made all these and they might've been weirder. What was that? How long did it take you? Oh, this was probably hours every day for a month. Just like, just grinding through it. I was working on it pretty much every night and on the weekends just plugging in and getting results and plugging in and getting results. And then sometimes I'd take like a break a day or two to just be like, I don't like where this is going. And then I'd jump back into it again. So at the end of it, 
I'm still really, it's, it's kind of my artistic vision that is controlling the process. So this is why I refer to it as a tool. And, and it is, of course, highly reliant on humans making choices. So we feel like we have agency in this process, but it's also quite constrained. And so I would sort of bring that up as something that good technology does to us and good technology in the terms of the technology that captures us makes us feel like we have agency. But do we really have agency or is the architecture of the program already sort of limiting what we can do? So those are kind of the broader questions to, to just be aware of as you go down these paths. So like social media has, it already has its control mechanisms built into place, just things like the like hearts, validation, the way the algorithm spins things out, certain things will get more attention than other things. And each one of those is a pat on the head, right? The Pavlovian training again. And so that's how we get sort of channeled and funneled into caring about certain things is by seeing it replicated and praised. So that's what I think is also happening with AI in a lot of regards. Okay, so I have a question too. Yeah. You've talked a lot about the kind of one dimensionality of the end result. So the flat, I mean, you talk about these softwares that flatten everything and give you kind of this, this one version. Um, if we go back to the original um, Dolly illustration, so like the Queen's Court, he's pulling from prior work of his own that is drawing from inspiration from Malay, for instance. So as uh, probably a couple of questions. It sounds as though you were really, really frustrated with the overall flatness and kind of lack of depth of the end result. But then also, it's being fed by the artist. So how are you as the operator of this tool, adding that richness back in, or is that even a possibility? I was initially attempting to add a lot of that richness back in. Um, it seemed to, so what happens in programs like Midjourney is they have about a 30 to 40 character reference that they draw from. Beyond that, they quit pulling in. So these nine page prompts I was talking about, like there's only a limited amount of that and it's just gathering keywords and it will tell you in the papers on Midjourney that it will only accept up to 30 or 40 keywords. So what I did as the workaround for that was produce images and then use images as references to, and then add in additional prompts. So you were able to go back in and use a visual to help guide the process after the initial verbal? Like yes. Prompt? So... I ended up with a, a chain of steps to get me to a point where it was more controlled, but it had to be controlled through image reference rather than controlled through text. So that's, that's the path that I took. I'm sure there's other paths that could be taken there. But yeah, there's, there's limitations there. And I, could, I also couldn't, if you, I mentioned Dolly, program just went crazy. Like it just went off the rails because he's, I guess, just so famous. It's the same as if I mentioned Warhol. It's, and then you tell it to make something obscure that he did and it can't do it. It just keeps going back to soup cans and Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, mm -hmm. because that's what the internet focuses on. Right? Yeah, so that would be the flatness I'm speaking of. The I guess? Yeah, or yeah, just the most recognizable aspect. That, that is what it's actually after to give people, and most, for most people, that is the result they want is the most common aspect is that's the depth level of it. So when you're feeding it like the obscure results, is it in essence becoming like more, have, has more breadth overall? And at the same time, are you like adding to the program, I guess? I think just by using it, you have to, yeah, by adding to the program, it's probably pulling from what I do. The, it's tracking all the liking and clicking and upscaling and which regions. You can even vary or paint various regions of it now. And I'm sure it's tracking all that and saying like, they don't like it when we do this. They do like it when we do this. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a feedback system, machine learning in that sense, I think. So yeah, I, I'm playing with it and yeah, there's, I guess we could even get into it in the demo stuff tomorrow, but there's uh, some really crazy stuff about how some of them are forum based on Discord. 
So you get to see everything everyone else is doing and then you can pull from those. And so I can take somebody else's image and drag it into my own prompts and run it. So it's a collaborative crowdsourced project. But yeah, um, yeah. One question I had uh, just bouncing off that was, you know, when you tend to be like just generating all these images, you tend to have a sort of like, <coughs> do you ever find yourself liking a style more and begin to just, you know, work it more into like other prompts? Just because I know like how the example you told us, like artists, when they give us good feedback, like the, our professors, yeah. we tend to just continue with it because we're like pushing for greatness. Did you tend to just see yourself Pushing like a certain style? Yeah, I found myself like leaning into certain styles. And I think that was when I found myself going off what I was calling off track. Like, because I tried to lay out the, the, the idea of where I wanted to go first. And then when I was finding that I was chasing my own style, this own style. Yeah, I found that quite a bit. It's, it's actually quite fun, you know, to go that way. But also this has to come with my own disposition, my own training as an artist that's now getting embedded back into the machine. And so I, th I think these, these loops are pretty crazy. And whether or not those loops, like whether you're fixing the machine or just adding more noise into it, I don't, I don't really know. I think that that's kind of, um, the, the biggest thing I would say is that everyone is making a choice at every step and it's a visual choice or it's a prompt word choice or something. And so it's really, you feel like you're making the work. And at and some level you are, right? But I also, once again, would say that in the time I spent figuring this out, I could have just made these by hand and people probably would have liked them more. Yeah. So <laughs> I will say that, that these are, I don't even know if these are likable, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm too, uh, whatever. It's, I got too close to it. I can't even see them anymore. Yeah. All right, it looks like a lot of our students have to go to class. So. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.